Hello again, welcome to our show. Uh, today I'm talking about four films by, that were written by John Sayles early in his career. A lot of them for Roger Corman. They're all genre films. And um, so they are Piranha, The Howling, the Studio Dante films, your Alligator by Louis Teague, and your Battle Beyond the Stars by some guy Jimmy Takapura or something, I can't remember how you pronounce his surname. Um, these are all terrific, enjoyable genre films. I've not seen Lady in Red or Louis Teague when he wrote, but these were the kind of films Sales was writing while he was uh, preparing to do the Turn of Seekers 7 and then start his directing career. But he wrote a lot of, while he was writing his novels, he also wrote some films for Roger Corman and low budget distributors. And he made a good living off it, and he made some really f enjoyable films. Because, I mean, of, of all the ones I've seen, there's not a bad one in the bunch, really. They're all good. They're all really well made. They, I'll start with the Dante ones, um, really. Um, the first one, Piranha, was uh, Joe Dante's um, debut as a, as a director of No. He did High School Confidential, but this is the film people noticed. Oh, this guy's a talent. It did not hinder him to have a good script. So I just wrote the script. It was an unapologetic George ripoff that even Spielberg likes. He said that's the best George ripoff by a mile. It's got a sense of humour. It's more about characters than the. There's a good action, but the characters actually um, are the thing. And it actually has a weird thing for a Dante film, and it has a good remake. You know. The sequels aren't good, but they does have a good, a genuine good remake. I mean, each... <laughs> Piranha's weird because both times, Piranha then the Alexander Adja film, were both enjoyable, then they both had terrible sequels. Really weird. Um, and James Cameron directed the um, Piranha 2. Oh, he said he did a little bit of it, but um, his name's on the title, so... So, um, anyway... Piranha, Sam Bradford Dillon uh, as a alcoholic guy who lives out in the backwoods, he doesn't like people much and he's he gets involved with Piranha because he's helping this woman who's looking for skip tracers who's she's just looked trying to look for someone who was who we see die in the first moment of the film killed by piranhas. They go to investigate this little this kind of old military base and accidentally released the, the, uh, a school of piranhas who were in the who were, who were in this um, water area that was locked off from everywhere else. The piranhas get loose because of the heroes, and they have to try and chase them down and stop them from uh, reaching civilization and killing everybody. And that's the story. You get uh, Kim McCarthy is the inventor of these killer piranhas, or the person who's looking after them who's investigating them. You've got um, Barbara Steele as a, as a creepy military woman. But the best thing is the relationship between uh, Bradford Dillon as an alcoholic and the woman playing the female lead who's a bossy, determined woman who's out to prove herself in the world. I mean, the good thing about Sales is he is good with characters. That's what he's really good at. So, what could be an annoying character, the Skip Tracer is actually a really enjoyable character because you see her point of view, she's not trying to be mean or anything, she's got a job to do so she won't take any crap from anybody. That comes through, it's understandable. The Bradford Dillon our character's alcoholic, he's a true bad times, you get his point of view as well, he's not a bad guy, he's just trying to survive a bad set of experiences, he's just trying to get through a bad time. Everyone has a point of view, so a lot of the stuff that actually come through in Sales' non-genre films are actually in his genre films too. Non-judgmental characters who are enjoyable, who have good dialogue, who can hold their own, who have interest in stories. Even the villains have interest in stories, they're not. Even the stalker villains have some good lines and of course Dante's good at the piranha stuff and the humour. Dante gets the humour straight away. A lot of the gags are funny. And then when it comes to horror, it's pretty brutal. People die horribly. It's just a really well made film. Um, I'm trying not to go into tons of details with all these films. You should just watch, even though they've been out for a long time, just try and just watch them and enjoy them. 
I'm trying not to give some of the spoilers away or anything. But it's a wonderful film. Piranha's a great start to a career, you know. It's a pretentious low budget film making, but it should be. Cause it's, doing a, it's a Roger Corman production. It's the common idea of save money but have some good character stuff. Like invest in character scenes because you don't have that much time for the monster scenes. The monster scenes have to appear and hit every so often, but in between that you have to have good character stuff. So that's why you had people like John Sales, Jonathan Demi, Joe Dante, people who could do character stuff. They then did how uh, how they followed, I'm not sure I don't think it was a Roger Corman production, but this was um Sales and Dante together again. Taking a book they didn't like and basically throwing the book out and doing their own thing. The Dante said it was a horrible book, so they just ignored it and did their own werewolf movie. And this came out at the same time as American Werewolf from London. So both are compared, but they were both very different films, but they both had shared a sense of humour, a sense of knowledge of the genre past of werewolf movies and an affection for werewolves, but also both had big new transformation scenes. Now I think American Werewolf in London is a better film actually, it's, got, it's leaner and it has, it gets the point quicker of every moment. But The Howling's a lot of fun too. The Howling has Dee Wallace as the lead actress and she's a really good character who's just trying to, um, you know, get on with her life and, you know, she's a, she's, um, she's a newswoman, she's trying to just have a good career. She's attacked during a news story by a character called Eddie the Mad Rapist. And <laughs> uh, yeah, it's very tasteful. But she's trying to become a reporter, but she also gets traumatized. So a psychiatrist suggests she goes to this um place in the country and it'll help her heal and help her get her um, head back together again. So her and her boyfriend go out there and it turns out it's for the werewolves. And that comes across pretty quick, so I'm not spoiling anything. It's a werewolf movie. And lots of things happen. This one, it's a case of, once they get to the werewolf facility, the plot slows down quite a bit, and it's all about little character beats. Like, I don't think they worked out the, the A to B to see the story as well as some of the other films that John Steele was wrote. This one feels like it was written are pretty much on the sly and they're trying to walk around our location more than finding interesting things to do. So people wander off and get killed and a lot of the cliches you get of those kind of movies. But it's really witty, there's some really good characters, the lead characters are great, all the supporting characters are fun and it's really enjoyable. So it doesn't have the momentum of American Werewolf or Piranha but it is really enjoyable. And it has a really great ending. And it's wonderfully cynical about uh, the way human beings can be and how flawed they are. And it feels very sales like in some ways, even though he's stuck with a werewolf movie. You know, it's um it's not his or Dante's best work. I would say Piranha is the one to watch of those two films. I guess a Piranha's a stronger film. But the Howling's a lot of fun. Howling's really a lot of fun. But I, I would definitely say out of these four films I'm covering, the Howling is Probably the one I'd watch least, really, because I just think the middle section's a bit slow, even though there's lots of really fun things in there. It just momentum wise, it's not as clever as some of the other sales films. Now we get to uh, well, my favourite of the four, which is Alligator. Alligator is a. Uh, is that old um, Webb's tale of the alligator that gets thrown down the toilet, it's flushed down the toilet, and comes back years later? And this is a movie about that idea and it's really wonderful because it, it's like taking that kind of fantasy idea, plunking it in the real world where the alligator has been eating all the, these animals who have been experimented on by these genetics people and the animals have been thrown away. That, that's been feeding the alligator because the alligator has been eating the flesh of these things and the, the mutations have caused that to mutate and get much bigger than it should be. So it's a super alligator. It's still in the sewers, but, but as the film starts, it starts to develop a taste for people and starts to leave in the sewer to get some more fresh meat. But the, the, most of the film is seen from the point of view of Robert Foster's character, who is this cop who's had a traumatic past, and he is he's kind of a loner, but he's not a loner in a way that most cops are. Most cops are loners are very Dirty Harry influenced. He's not a Dirty Harry, he's not trying to shoot anybody. 
he admits to his own flaws and how scary gunfights are. I mean, he's not trying. He's not trying to jump out and actually uh, have a a fist fight or gunfight with anybody ever. He's trying to work it out logically to try and make sure that justice is done. But he's cynical about the way justice is done. He's cynical about the politics involved. And it's just a very warm presence. Robert Foster's great in this film. He's really, really good. I mean, there's some weird jokes about his hair. He's starting to thin at the top, and I'm making jokes about that. It's, it's probably as close as before he did his own films. This is as close to a kind of sales character we're going to get in these films before sales took over the direction. I'm actually kind of amazed that Foster wasn't really in a lot of sales films afterwards because he seemed so much like a sales character in this film. He just seemed very much like a prototype for a sales character. And he was very naturalistic and funny. Just a really terrific character. I mean, Tarantino admitted this film and Jackie Brown character quite a little bit. And you can see why there was a kind of humanity to him despite all the problems he's facing. And he's just trying to get on with his life and try to find out what's killing all these people. And it turns out it's, when he finds out it's a giant alligator, he has to go through the whole thing of no one believes him. And even he knows, what's cool about this film is even he knows how he sounds. Like he knows, I know exactly what you're thinking when I tell you this. It's like, it's really funny because he understands he sounds crazy. And he's trying to deal with reporters, with the top brass. But in a very, uns in a very kind of subtle way where it's showing you a lot of stuff you see in our films, like the corruption between the, the mayor's office and the police and big business, but it doesn't have any casual way that shows this happens all the time and no one gets upset by it, it's just not the way things go. Very much the way we were going to do with uh, City of Hope. This was coming years before in a giant alligator film, but there was a lot of stuff there that actually was going to go forward and see his career. In an interesting way. So Alligator is, is, is my favourite of the sales films he wrote. It's really good. And it's really enjoyable because it is about giant alligator. When a giant alligator actually comes out and takes out some of the villains at the end, it's really satisfying because the villains are scummy. The leading actress isn't as good as the leading actress in um, um, Piranha, but she is decent. But she never had much of a career afterwards and it's like, in the scenes, Robert Foster doing most of the work, really. he's. But despite that, it's still a wonderful film, really enjoyable. I mean, Perry Lang, who's a character actor from the 70s, was in 1941, Big Red One. He appears in this one as well, in a very short, early role. And he becomes alligator food. A lot of fun. I highly recommend this one. Finally, we have Battle Beyond the Stars, which is probably the first film sales that I ever saw. Because it's a Roger Conn produced film. James Cameron did the effects. James Horner did the music. And you can see it's... You see how he repeated some of this music later on. And you have, you have a, a cast of character actors who have all from a ball because sales write the scripts. It's a sci-fi remake of Magnificent Seven or Seven Samurai. But more Magnificent Seven, actually. Like, I, I think um, sales has enough respect for Seven Samurai not to try and include this in this blatant rip-off. But it's really enjoyable. Um, basically, John Saxon plays this uh, mad ruler who's going around just terrifying all these people and these Batland planets to actually give them all their, all their food or will kill them and turn the planet into a giant sun. You know, it's a nice threatening villain move. Richard Thomas from the Waltons is the innocent lad who is on one of these planets and he, he is trusted by his people to go and find some warriors to help fight these people. You know, and he goes around the near galaxy and starts finding these people are going to go fight. So he finds seven of them, including Robert Vaughn, who was in Magnificent Seven. Playing a, a similar character, but in this one he didn't have any problem killing people. Um, there's George Papard, the space cowboy, and he's done a lot of fun. Civil Dining is a Valkyrie. You have these weird aliens who are all one, they're all linked as one, even though they have different bodies. You have a character who's a mercenary, he's the last of his race, who's out to kill with Saxon for revenge. You've just got all of these characters. They're all great. You've got um, Darlene Fugel as a as the as naive daughter of this scientist who makes all these robots. 
So she's as naive as uh, Richard Thomas says, and they're both, you know, they're the, they're the kind of wide-eyed innocence in the story. And what's really good is, because Sales has a structure, it's a Magnificent Seven structure, the people are threatened, you find the, the warriors, you go back and you fight the villain. He's got a structure, it's set in space, so he can have some funny ideas. It allows Sales to do what he does best of all these weird character moments, all these weird little details throughout it, so every scene in the first half as Thomas goes and meets a new character and brings him on board, gives Sales a chance to do basically a, a dialogue set piece with somebody, then a dialogue set piece, then you have tons of weird sci-fi ideas. So it feels like a pulp novel, filmed. That's wonderful, it's just this wonderful atmosphere. It's low budget, the effects are not bad. They're nicely funny designs to them. Uh, some of the stuff comes from Battlestar Galactica. The, the sound effects come from Battlestar Galactica. You can instantly hear it. And the design of the lead villain's ship is very much the one of the designs from Battlestar Galactica, but it looks like they've changed a few things around to not get sued. But it's pretty much the same ship. <laughs> but it's still wonderful. It's, um, it's just a really enjoyable film. All the actors know what film they're in. They're all having a ball. Everyone's having a great time. And it just works, because everyone knows, yeah, I'm an exploitation movie, but it's a well-written exploitation movie, and everyone's in it together. Everyone gets a moment, or two more, two or three moments, even the weird aliens, that they introduce weird characteristics early on, which actually pay off later on. And, you know, John Saxon's a good villain, who's, re who's replacing body parts, because whenever someone gets damaged, replaces his body parts and the, the, the heroes know this and try and trick him through that as well. It's, there's wonderful little ideas throughout just to keep it going. And it's just a wonderful little film. And I'd highly recommend it. It's just great. All these four films are great fun to watch. You're not going to get any problem with watching any of them. They're all really well made. Well written. The, the actors are having fun because they've been given eccentric character parts they stick their teeth into. Even the smaller parts have fun stuff to do. So it's, it's a sign of having a good, a good writer being able to write these parts for, for actors so the expo an exploitation movie can be enjoyable rather than the drag during the dialogue scenes. So these are all wonderful. Go watch them before you go into the proper sales films. So I should say I'm kind of surprised that Sort of Running hasn't done this video before me. It feels like his kind of video that so why hasn't he done this? I feel like um, I feel a bit let down and disappointed in him. So maybe you're watching this and know that. Why did I beat you to this one? Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. I'll be back soon with another one. Right, bye for now.